Good morning and a very warm welcome to St Paul's Church on this Good Friday morning in 2021. My name is Rupert Mackay, the minister here at St Paul's Church, Hadley Wood, and it's wonderful that you could join us on this Good Friday morning. I'd just like to explain what will soon take place, which is our normal practice. Uh, we meditate upon God's word. Uh, we have a number of different readings of God's promise of Jesus and uh, also fulfillment of what Jesus came to do on the cross at Jerusalem. We have those verses explained to us. And then there's an opportunity to reflect, uh, to ponder, to think on those verses that are read out to us. Uh, also, we have a company of music that helps you to focus upon what Jesus did for us on that Good Friday. That Good Friday was good because Jesus defeated Satan and he paid the penalty of all our sin on the cross so that we can be forgiven and have the wonderful hope of the resurrected life, which is assured to us on Easter Sunday in a few days' time. So as I begin, let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, in mercy look upon this your church family, for which the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 6, The Promised Jesus. In this passage, written 680 years before the birth of Jesus, the promise of a substitute saviour is given by God. He would not be a worldly leader, as nothing in his appearance would attract us to him. He would be despised, rejected and looked down upon by all of mankind. However, in his pierced and God-forsaken death on the cross, he would pay for our transgressions. He would be crushed for our iniquities, as death would bring us peace with God. The reality is that all of mankind of every age has led a life of going astray. Each of us has turned to his own way against God. But the good news of the gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ died for us all, for our sins on the cross once and for all. Let us pause to acknowledge our sin, our iniquities, our infirmities, our transgressions, and our going astray from the Lord. Isaiah 53 verse 1 to 6. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The second reading is taken from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. 
he sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. In a world that craves love and yet fails to love, John points to the purpose of Jesus coming. God showed his love for us by sending his one and only son into the world so that through him we might live. God's desire is for his people to truly live, not only in this life, but for all eternity. And this comes about not by us loving God, but by us embracing his love for us in the person of Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross achieves what we could never achieve. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment for all our sin, and this atonement for all our sin gives us atonement and at one moment with God. Let us pause and consider not our love for God or our human love for one another, but God's great love for us. God, despite our being sinners, sent his one and only Son to die for us. This is true, divine, selfless love. The Nature of Jesus, Philippians 2, 5-11 Here Paul encourages us to have the same nature as Jesus, not to earn our favour towards God, but in response to his love. Now let us marvel at Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to grasp. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for sin. He humbled himself and was obedient to death on a Roman cross. As a result, God raised him up to the right hand side of God the Father, let us now set aside our ambitions to be great, influential, powerful, popular, and let us surrender our lives to the one to whom everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of his servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Innocence of Jesus. Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. This can be found on page 1582 of the Pew Bibles. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Now it was a custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The contrast cannot be more striking. The people cry for the release of guilty Barabbas, an insurrectionist who had committed murder. Whereas Jesus, the innocent one, has healed the sick, fed the hungry, comforted the outcast, forgiven the sinner, and brought back to life the dead. Yet the crowd called for Jesus' crucifixion, despite his clear innocence confirmed by Pilate. Let us marvel at the obedience and quiet dignity of Jesus as he goes to his death, entrusting himself to his father as he goes through such injustice. The Mocking of Jesus Mark chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 16, and you can find that on page 1583. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with the staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him, the written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him 
also heaped insults on him. Jesus is mocked as king, derided by the crowds and scorned by the religious leaders as a saviour. Yet Jesus was sovereignly undertaking his father's will as predicted from Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Also the words of Psalm 22 come true. All who see me mock me. They hail insults, shaking their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Yet through it all, Jesus is the supreme king and only saviour of sinners. The Achievement of Jesus, Mark 15, verses 33 to 41. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Here we have the ultimate understanding of the cross of Jesus revealed to us. As darkness covers the whole land, predicted by the prophet Amos, and just like that which had preceded the first Passover, we now have the ultimate Passover sacrifice, not of a lamb, but of the Lord Jesus himself. On the cross, Jesus becomes God forsaken for us, crying out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A question asked by Jesus, not for himself, but for us so that we might know that Jesus was being cut off from God. As he hung on that cross, he was taking upon himself the punishment for all our sin. Then, also for the benefit of our understanding, as Jesus breathes his last, a final miracle takes place 
some distance away in the temple. The temple curtain, which had previously separated the presence of God from his people, is dramatically torn in two from top to bottom, indicating in a very public sign that the way into God's presence was now open for everyone who comes to Jesus. This is clearly demonstrated as a Roman soldier makes his profession of faith with these words, which we can confirm in our own hearts. Surely this man was the Son of God. And now to close our time together, two short prayers. Firstly, the set collect for Good Friday. Almighty God, in mercy look on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, on this Good Friday, we remember with penitence and gratitude the agony and shame, the darkness and desolation you endured on Calvary for us and for the redemption of mankind that you won for us. As we meet under the shadow of the cross, we ask you to help us to understand something more of what it costs you to bear away our sin that we may love and serve you better, our only mediator and most merciful redeemer, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to uh, finish today with the great hymn written by Isaac Watts, uh, one of our foremost hymn writers ever. He wrote at least 800 hymns. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. <clears throat>